Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and the uh, uh, nice introduction. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I was actually here at HITS a couple of years ago um, for, for um, a workshop. Um, and I cycled here this morning. So going up the hill is a bit like going up the hill in Bath. So the hill in Bath is actually even steeper. So <laughs> I had to kind of practice for that for a couple of years now. Um, so uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, fast multiple methods for um, yeah, kinetic and uh, standard Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and this is work done uh, together with Will uh, Saunders, who was a PhD student in Bath and uh, James Grant, who um, used to be in the chemistry department, uh, also in Bath. So they both have moved on now, but the work was done when they were both uh, in Bath. So here is um, an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So um, I just want to introduce the problem um, uh, and talk about molecular simulation with long range interactions, talk a bit about the hardware zoo. So, um, and then move on to long range interactions and just say uh, something about how you can um, uh, uh, treat them efficiently. Um, and I will mainly talk about the fast multiple method, but I don't want to go into lots of mathematical details. So just kind of give you a general idea of how this works. And then really the, the core part of my talk is this bit here where I'm going to talk about how you can use fast multiple for kinetic or standard Monte Carlo um, uh, simulations. And at the end, I want to talk about um, how we implemented this. So um, one thing that Will did in his PhD was write this framework for doing these kind of simulations. And that's kind of a Python code generation system that makes it very easy to, to implement this and still um, get efficient uh, code out of it. Um, so just to set the scene. Um, so what do I mean by kind of interacting particles? So this is a simulation um, of uh, water um, and that's actually a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, here, so what you have is you have these particles, they are charged and they just move around and they interact somehow. So this is a MD simulation, but I'm going to talk about molecular, um, Monte Carlo mainly. Um, so I'm not going to talk about quantum effects. So these particles are just treated as classical particles that interact uh, somehow. So, um, so what do you do in these simulations? So if you do molecular dynamics, you simulate the trajectories of particles. So you have N particles, so they interact somehow. So the blue blobs, the blobs are the particles and the interactions are the red uh, arrows. Um, and what you need to do when you simulate this, you need to um, calculate the forces, which are given as the derivatives of some uh, uh, potential. And um, then you integrate these forces uh, numerically uh, somehow and you get these trajectories. And that's something that you do when you simulate um, a microcanonical ensemble where you have the, the energy doesn't change. The other thing you can do is you can do a Monte Carlo simulation. And what you do there is you uh, propose moves. Um, so you take a particle and you move it somewhere else. And then there's a certain probability that uh, tells you whether you accept that move or uh, reject it. And that probability is uh, given by um, the exponential of some difference in the uh, uh, total energy. Uh, so you need to calculate the total energy for the original particle position and then for the position of the moved uh, particle. And all this you need to do for, um, you need to do efficiently for large numbers of particles. So you need good algorithms and you also need to implement them efficiently when you do this. So um, what's the challenge with long range interactions? So there is an algorithmic challenge. Um, so if you look at charged particles, so these particles ele um, interact electrostatically then um, to compute the total energy of N charges, what you need to do is you need to kind of go, um, you loop over all particles and you calculate the um, interaction of each particle to each other particle. So you can write this down as the sum here and it's a double sum. So the number of terms in this sum is uh, one half N times N minus one. So if the N becomes very large, that grows proportionally um, to um, N uh, squared. Um, so you have the same problem when you calculate forces. So what you have to do when you calculate forces is you have to loop over all n particles. And then for each particle, you need to calculate um, uh, this force. And to compute the force, you have to, again, uh, take a particle and then compute the interaction with all other particles. So there's n minus one other particles. So in total, that also grows like order n squared. So and that's kind of really killing you if you have um, 
a large number n of particles. So it gets even worse. So what I talked about before was a free uh, system. So the particles are just somewhere in space and they interact. Now that's what I show here. So if you um, simulate uh, materials, um, so then you usually can't simulate the entire, an entire chunk of, of material, an entire battery or whatever. So you have to kind of uh, just pick um, a little chunk. And when you do this, you somehow have to um, take into account boundary conditions. Um, and you can do this by uh, using periodic boundary conditions. So you just replicate the system um, an infinite number of times um, and you get these boundary conditions. But now the problem is that you have um, actually have an infinite sum. So if you pick one particle, that particle interacts with all other particles. Um, so it's not really clear how you do that. And you have to be a bit careful when you truncate this um, because actually um, the sum is conditionally convergent. So if you have a dipole moment in your, in your box, then um, the, uh, it's not really clear what uh, the answer is. So that depends at boundary conditions at infinity. So you have to be really careful there. Um, so the other challenge is kind of an implementation challenge. So once you have a good algorithm for doing all this, um, you somehow need to uh, implement this. And if you look at, um, I mean, this is now a couple of years old, but this is, um, these are some numbers that I pulled off. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, this, this, this Archer computer. So if you have, um, so that was a big supercomputer in the UK. And if you look at how much time that actually spends on simulating particle interactions somehow, um, then it's about 20% of the time. Um, so if you can somehow reduce that time, that obviously means you can use that computer much more efficiently. So um, that's why you want to implement your algorithms in an efficient way. And that's not very easy because in the last few, I mean, sort of 20 years ago, all you did is you bought a bigger computer and that solved your problem, but you can't do that anymore. So now you have uh, normal chips, you have graphics cards, and there was also these uh, Xeon Phi cards up to a couple of years ago. So there was, um, I mean, the, the hardware changed all the time. Um, you have several layers of parallelisms. You have distributed memory across nodes. You have shared memory, and then you have things like vectorization. Uh, you might have to write some CUDA code or use intrinsics or vector libraries or whatever. So it's, it's quite complicated. And you also have to worry about um, the memory. So there's a complex cache hierarchy, a memory hierarchy on these, on these chips. So it's really a mess if you want to implement any of this. So it's really hard. And then the other thing is what people often do, they write kind of some codes, but then the post-processing, which is for example, some structure analysis, this is often then some handwritten non-parallel code. So, um, so there's some potential here to improve that. Okay, so um, let's have another look at these long range interactions. So that's just what I showed you before. So I have to compute uh, this uh, uh, double sum here. And then if I include the periodic copies, this becomes an infinite sum. So there's kind of three popular approaches. So one of them is um, eval summation. So I'm going to say a bit about uh, that. Um, and then there's this smooth particle mesh eval method that I'm not going to talk about. Um, so the eval summation reduces the time from order n squared to order n to the three half, and it can deal with these um, periodic copies. Um, the smooth particle the eval mesh eval method reduces it for, further to order n log n, and that's a big improvement because logarithms, I mean, are kind of much, they grow much slower than uh, n. And what I'm, I'm going to talk about is really the fast multifold method. So there the cost is order uh, n. So that's, I mean, you can't really beat that. If you have n particles, you have to do at least that usually. Um, so just one word on uh, the eval summation. So how does that work? So the idea is uh, shown here. So what you do, so this is just a sketch in one dimension. So if you have your charge distribution, which is represented by delta functions, then um, you add and subtract um, Gaussian functions. So these Gaussian functions are smooth um, and um, you, can, um, uh, you can then compute the potential of your charge distribution um, uh, for the smooth bit. Uh, you can do that in Fourier space. Um, and you truncate that at some point and you do the, the other bit, sort of the, the screened bit, so the red bit, you do that in, in real space. Um, but the advantage is that you have a distribution that decays really rapidly, so you can truncate that as well. And if you do that properly um, and tune these truncation parameters in the right way, then the complexity grows like order n to the three half. 
Um, but we can do better than that. And that's um, the fast multipole method. Um, and the idea is actually really simple. So if you have some charges, this cluster of charges, and if you look at this from very far away, then um, you don't really see the details of that distribution. You just kind of see a blob of a given charge. And if you look a bit closer, you might see kind of some gradients, some variations in this charge. Um, but the further away the charge distribution is, the uh, less details you see. And that's kind of a similar effect if you have an image here. Um, so if you look at this image uh, from very uh, uh, nearby, then you see all the structure. But if you look at it from a distance, it's just a gray blob. And then you might kind of resolve some gradient as you get closer. So you see that it the, 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 um, gets light and darker at the top. Um, and, and then eventually you see the structure. So mathematically, you can do this um, uh, as an expansion in spherical harmonics. So if you have your charge distribution, um, then you uh, write this as a sum of these kind of uh, uh, basis functions, and they become more and more complicated as, um, as the, the order increases. OK, so um, as I say, I'm not going to go into the details, but here's just the idea. So if you have a charge distribution, um, then you can do two things. So if that charge distribution is um, around the origin, then for distances very far away, you can expand it uh, like this. So you get your um, uh, multipole uh, functions here, your spherical harmonics. You get some coefficients here, and then you get these one over R terms. And they really say, um, and they really tell you what I told you before. So if, if you go further away, then the, um, the terms with a larger n um, are suppressed kind of uh, stronger. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is if you have a charge distribution very far away from you and you're sitting at the origin, then you can write down the expansion like this. So you have powers of R here and you have coefficients here and then the spherical harmonics. So that's kind of, um, uh, that's um, a so-called local expansion here. Then what the fast multiple method now does is essentially does the following. So it constructs, uh, so there's an upward pass and a downward pass. So it constructs a multiple expansion of your charges on a mesh hierarchy. Um, and uh, it does this on coarser and coarser meshes. And then it goes kind of back down and it constructs local expansions in these kind of uh, small cells uh, here. And you can then show that the computational complexity is order n. <clears throat> and actually um, it's, uh, uh, there is a constant here, and that's kind of, I think, one reason why people don't really use it that much. So the cost actually grows with the um, inverse fourth power of the error that you make. So if you make this expansion more accurate, <clears throat> you, um, uh, it becomes much more expensive. So this is another sketch here um, uh, to show you how this happens. So it works. So you have um, your mesh on the finest level. You do multiple expansion of the charges in each cell. You combine these uh, expansions here uh, in, a, in a clever way, and you do that until you get to the coarsest level. Um, on the coarsest level, you also do direct summation of the faraway periodic images, um, and you get um, uh, local expansions um, from this. Um, and um, when you have these local expansions on the core cells, you add uh, in the contributions of um, cells that are kind of further and further away. So you um, you start, for example, here. So you want to know the local expansion here, and you only include the, the, the multiple expansions from the gray cells here. So then you obviously ignore the bit uh, here, but you treat that then on the next um, final level where you include um, uh, the charges, uh, the, the expansions uh, uh, here. And you do that kind of all the way uh, to the finest level, and you get your local expansions in the, in the fine uh, cells there. Okay, so that's something that people have been doing for a long time. Um, so um, what, what is new? What did we do differently? So um, one thing we did is we um, adapted kind of the standard Monte Carlo method uh, to be able to deal with this. So just to remind you, if you do um, a standard Monte Carlo move, you pick a particle and you move it to a new position. Um, you compute the difference in the energy so you have some energy after the move and uh, some energy before the move. And then you use that to compute the um, acceptance uh, probability uh, uh, here. So if you do this uh, naively, then um, for each move, you have to compute the interactions of the original charge with all the other charges. 
and then the uh, a charge at the new position with all the other charges. So that's kind of a cost of order n, and you have to do that for every uh, for every move. So that's really expensive. So okay, so how did we do this? So we used um, the fast multipole method instead, and um, it's actually quite simple. If you just think about uh, the change in energy when you propose a move, so all you need to do is so you have your, your particle before the move that's in some cell alpha, and after the move, it's sitting in some cell alpha prime. So all you need to do is you need to evaluate your fast multipole expansion in the original cell and in the new cell, and you uh, uh, subtract them. Um, and then you have to include some interactions with uh, nearby charges, so you can't get around that. But there's only a small number uh, that you have to uh, 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 worry about uh, here. So that's um, uh, just some constant cost. So that's the green terms here. And then you have to make sure that you don't double count. You have to subtract this term here, uh, uh, which is also uh, really cheap. So that's really nice. So if you if you propose a move, the cost is uh, is kind of constant. Now the problem is if you then accept the move, what you have to do is you have to rebuild your entire uh, multipole expansion, your fast multipole expansion, and that incurs a cost of order n. So you're kind of back to where you were uh, before. So that uh, didn't really help. Okay. So what's the solution to this? So the solution is actually really really simple. So all you do is when you have your local expansion on the finest level, you don't just store that. You just store the local expansion on each level here. So you just split this uh, up. So you have a sum here. Then on each level, you just uh, include the contributions um, from the charges on a particular level. You know? So the, the green charges are included in this term here. The blue charges are included in this term here. And then I have the nearby ones in the, in the red term uh, here. So that's just an identity. Um, so you have to store more uh, numbers. But the thing is now, if you now do a move, you can actually um, think about this. And when you move your particle, you only have to update a finite number of um, expansions. Now, so if you move a particle from here, from here to here, then on each level, you only have to update the expansions in these blue cells here. And there's always um, a finite number of these on each level. So you need to do that for the original position and the new position. Um, and you have to do that on each level. So um, you have um, the number of levels is proportional to the logarithm of the number of particles. So the total complexity is order um, L, which is the number of levels or order uh, uh, log N. And that grows much slower than the N. So that means that when you accept the move, you only incur cost of order log N now, which is much better. Now you pay a price for this um, when you um, when you um, evaluate the charge at the uh, old and the new position. You now have to do that on each level because uh, the local expansion is given by the sum here. So that also incurs a cost of order uh, log uh, uh, n, but that's okay. I mean that grows at the same rate as this one here. So you um, you you you're actually okay when you look at it uh, together. Okay, so um, there's an alternative approach. So when we worked on this, we, we, we kind of came up with this method and then we actually looked at the literature and we saw that people had done, uh, when we were working on this basically about the same time, um, but they published it a bit faster, um, they did something similar. So what they did is they, um, they, they didn't store the local expansion coefficients, they only stored the multiple expansion coefficients. Um, so you can do that. Um, so, but the downside is that, um, uh, the proposals become more expensive. So if they use their method, it also grows like order log n. But when you do a proposal, that becomes more expensive. And what they gain is that um, uh, accepting a move becomes uh, cheaper. So all, both methods are order log n, but the constants are kind of different. Now, the thing is, when you look at uh, what happens in the simulation, you typically propose much more moves than you accept. So really what you want to do is you want to make your proposals as cheap as possible. Um, and uh, uh, then you have some cost for accepting it. So they sort of got it the wrong way around. Um, so um, yeah, so our method is kind of making proposals cheaper and accepting a bit more expensive. Okay, so we compared this. So these are the two methods um, here. So um, this is our work. Um, so the, the blue curve is uh, the cost for proposing. 
um, a move, and then the red curve is the cost for accepting it um, with our method. And the same with the with the method in that paper here. Um, you just see that the curves are kind of flipped. So in our method, it's very cheap to propose something, but more expensive to accept. And in their method, it's the other way around. So this is done in our code. So that's we we are not comparing two different codes. That's really the same code. Um, so the jumps they just come from the fact that um, you increase the number of levels. Um, and the growth that you can see, I mean, there's kind of some local variation as you increase the number of charges, but overall it grows like uh, log uh, n as you would expect, even though you might not really see it uh, so obviously here. Okay, so how does this then look like when we look at an entire simulation? So um, if you look at an entire simulation, um, then um, it uh, looks like this. So what I show here is, um, the, uh, the time per Metropolis Hastings step as a function of the number of charges. And the um, black curve is uh, uh, done with the Monte. So that's um, a Monte Carlo code that uses um, uh, a standard Ebert summation. So that's the uh, black curve here. And that grows um, as you would expect it to grow. Um, and then we compared our method, which is shown in red here to the method in that other paper, which is the blue curve here. And this is the log log plot. So you don't really see much difference between these two. Uh, you definitely see the much slower growth. And if you then kind of zoom in and you plot this uh, here, but use um, a, a non-logarithmic scale on the vertical axis, then you really see that we are about sort of 20% faster and the gap kind of grows. And when you work this out theoretically, you kind of extrapolate these curves then we estimate that for very large numbers, we are about twice as fast. Okay, so that was uh, the standard Monte Carlo method. So let me move on to kinetic Monte Carlo and now. Um, so by the way, I'm sort of giving this talk backwards. So really when Will started his PhD, he first worked on the implementation, then we did kinetic Monte Carlo and then we did standard Monte Carlo in the end. Um, but I think this way it's just easier to tell the story. Um, so, um, Kinetic Monte Carlo is different. So um, the applications we looked at in Bath come from kind of solar cells and batteries. So we work with our colleagues in chemistry and physics. Um, so they work on these energy materials. And I'm not really an expert on kinetic Monte Carlo on the application. So that's just a sketch. So what you do here is you kind of have particles that can sit on certain sides in a lattice. And what can happen is that they kind of hop between uh, these sides in the lattice. So the red charge here can hop to this nearby side and then the next step it hops here uh, and so on. And they, they are also charged, so they interact electrostatically somehow. Okay, so now the question was, how can you get the um, electrostatic interactions in there? So but let me first tell you a bit about the algorithm that's used here. So because that's different from the Monte Carlo algorithm. So the way this works, is as uh, follows. So what you do is you first look at all potential moves. So you look at your particles, so they sit somewhere on your lattice. And for each particle, you look at where it can uh, potentially move. And they can usually only hop to kind of nearby uh, sites. So there's only a finite number per particle. For each of these potential hops, you uh, calculate the, um, the change in, uh, in, uh, in energy. And that gives you a propensity or probability for that event uh, to happen. And uh, you create this table of all propensities. Then you randomly uh, pick one uh, with a probability that's obviously uh, given by this propensity here. And once you accepted it, you move your particle and you have to update your uh, time um, uh, according to this uh, uh, formula here. Okay, so. Um, the question for us was really how you build in electrostatics when you do this. And again, it's um, expensive. So if you have n particles, each particle can hop to um, usually a fixed number of nearby sites, so maybe 10. So that's a fixed number. And then for each potential hop, we have to calculate the interactions with all n minus one other particles. So the cost for this grows in proportion to the number of particles. So the cost for one kinetic Monte Carlo step is order n squared again. And that's, that's really expensive. So we talked about people in chemistry and physics in Bath, and um, they said, so what people use nowadays is they just somehow truncate 
these electrostatic interactions. So that introduces systematic errors. Um, so this is actually shown here. So that's one plot that will uh, uh, produce. So um, he, he simulated a battery um, and he calculated some current in that battery. And then he used some standard approaches where you truncate. Don't ask me what exactly they are. Um, so he, he somehow truncate the interactions. And uh, this is the exact uh, calculation with our algorithm. And you see that there's quite a big uh, difference, even if you include kind of error bars. So you really need to be a bit careful with this. Um, so the other thing people did is they just limited the system sizes. Um, but if you do that, you might not resolve some physical effects. So one thing that people in Bath were really interested in is kind of grain boundaries. So if you have large scale defects in your batteries and your system is too small, you don't really uh, resolve uh, these. Okay, so um, what we did is we really just applied uh, the fast multipole method to this. Um, and implemented this and tried it out. So um, again, this is actually really straightforward. So all you need to do now is when you calculate your energy difference for each potential move, you just evaluate the, um, uh, uh, the local expansion in the fast multiple method. You do the direct interactions and then this uh, term here. And if you do this, you actually get the cost per proposal, which is just order one, because that's just evaluating some functions here and you only have to do these direct interactions for a fixed number of uh, uh, nearby particles. So that doesn't increase uh, with n. So you have to do that for each proposal. So um, uh, in total, the cost uh, then uh, grows in proportion to, to n. Now, when you move a particle, you have to update your local expansions, uh, but um, that just basically amounts to rebuilding your um, uh, uh, um, fast multipole kind of uh, tree your expansion. And you actually only have to do it for multi, uh, for a dipole here. So that's the difference in distribution between the new particle and the old particle. So there's, okay, there's some indices missing here. Uh, so um, that should of course not be the same here. Um, but anyway, it's just kind of the dipole of a particle that moves from one position to another position. So in total, the cost of the method is then order uh, N. Okay, so we implemented this in uh, our framework. So what I show here is just that this kind of works. So this is the number of charges. This is the time for kinetic Monte Carlo step. And uh, what you see is that the time grows uh, roughly in proportion to uh, uh, the system size. So these jumps here come from the fact that you are at another level in your fast multiple uh, tree. So that's where this comes from. So we looked at this a bit more closely. So this is um, uh, this time kind of broken up into the time per uh, proposal in green. So that's this one here. And then the time per um, accepted uh, step. And uh, this is kind of normalized to the number of charges. So this uh, remains constant. And these jumps again come from changing the number of levels. And if you add it up, you get this straight line. So that shows that it scales as you would expect. Okay, so um, let me finally say a bit about uh, the implementation. So I might have to go through this a bit uh, quicker. Um, so um, this is just the same slide as, uh, 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 as, as at the beginning. So just to remind you what you do in these simulations, you do molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo. Um, and the important thing really is that you, something usually happens between particles. So for each pair of particles, you have to do something. So you, for example, have to calculate forces or you have to calculate uh, energies here. Um, and then you might do something for each particle. So each particle might um, change um, its, its mass or whatever. So if you think about this in a very abstract way, then um, what the simulation does is it does something like this. So for each pair of, for all pairs of particles, uh, I and J do some operation um, X pair. So that's a very abstract way of writing this down. Um, or you might do something like this. So you might only look at particles that are cl uh, close together. So for all pairs that have a distance, this, uh, distance that's smaller than some cutoff, you do some operation. Uh, and that's, for example, the case if you have a Leonard Jones potential with a, with a cutoff. 
So how you execute this, how you do this operation here is really hardware dependent. So there's different algorithms for doing that on the CPU, on the GPU. Um, so it's um, different on some NVIDIA hardware and AMD hardware maybe. So you want to use some uh, OpenMP um, or um, CUDA or whatever to implement this. And how you do this, it's really of no interest to you as a scientist. So you really just want to tell the computer what you do for each particle pair. You don't want to kind of implement it. You don't want to worry about that. So, um, and that's kind of similar to uh, what people have done for PDE solvers. So um, this is um, uh, uh, some uh, work uh, done by people at Imperia. So uh, we worked with them when we uh, worked on uh, climate models. So they did something very similar. So they wrote this uh, library and what that allows you to do, it allows you to kind of loop over grids um, uh, uh, so of, uh, of cells and each cell has uh, maybe a facet here and there's some vertices here. And in these finite element codes, you want to do things like this. So you want to loop over all cells and then for all facets of that cell, you want to uh, uh, do some operations. So you want to take some value that's stored on a facet multiplied by some number and then add it to the value on the cell. And you want to do that for all cells. So that's a typical operation you might want to do in these codes. Um, and what they did at Imperia, they wrote this, this Python framework. So what you do is essentially you have some Python codes, you need to store your data on some data types, and then you write some kernel code. And that kernel code is the interesting bit because that encodes what you actually do on each individual cell. So that's kind of the red bit here, really. Um, and um, then you have to do some other stuff. And then you just tell uh, Python to loop over all, um, over all uh, cells. Uh, and you tell it uh, what you do is you tell Python that you will only read from the facets and you will increment the values on the, on the cells. And that allows uh, Python, uh, the code generation framework to do this efficiently and only to put in any kind of parallelization calls that are necessary in that case. So, and this grid uh, iteration, so looping over the grid is completely hidden from the user. So there is, I mean, there's one for loop here, but that for loop just goes over the facets of the cell. Um, but there's no for loop in this code here, which goes over all the cells. So that's completely hidden from you. Okay, so what did we do is we kind of did the same thing, but before I describe that, uh, let me just describe the idea. So in, in that area, this is called separation of concerns. So um, the idea is that you have some domain specialist uh, who knows all about the physics. So they write um, the local uh, particle pair kernel, and then they also write the overall algorithm that uh, uh, that's, for example, your MD, MD simulation, and you might couple um, a thermostat, or you might use some other fancy algorithm, uh, and that's something you you would then write in you know, as a domain specialist. So you write some kind of time stepping loop in Python for that, and then the computational scientists they kind of get their hands dirty and they actually then implement um, some framework that can execute your kernels on a particular pair of hardware. Uh, so and this is this framework which sits in the middle here. Um, and if the hardware changes, the computational scientist has to go back and they have to change the framework, um, but they don't have to change any of the code that's written by the domain specialist. And the domain specialist, don't, they don't have to adapt their code. They just use the new version of the framework and it just works. Okay, so I don't want to go into the details. So we kind of set up some uh, data structures for this. So you uh, need to think about how you store data, but actually what we just did is we just said each particle can store some properties. So that can be mass, a position, a velocity, or it can be something like the number of neighbors. So it can be anything. Um, they're just stored in NumPy arrays uh, and they're wrapped with some Python code. And then you can just um, access them in your C code by just writing a.i in brackets r and a.j in brackets r. And that gives you the, um, uh, the the properties of that particle, the rth property of that particle in each of the two particles in your pair. And then you can have some global properties, um, so it's like some energy, or you can have some bin radial distribution functions or whatever. Okay, so, and then we just wrote this Python code generation system just for molecular simulations, which is uh, 
again shown here. So that's what you write as a domain specialist. You write some little C kernel here and you write the overall algorithm. And then you have this code generation framework, which then automatically generates your code on CPUs and GPUs and uh, whatever uh, hardware. So um, you also need to tell the computer how you access your data. So you need to tell it whether you write or read data from individual particles um, uh, because that's needed by the code generation system uh, to insert the right parallelization calls. So here's an example. So this looks very similar to what I showed you before for the PDE code, but this is now done for uh, particles here. So the example is this, I mean, it's not really important. It's, very, it's a toy example. So you have a particle which has, I mean, each particle has some property. So that's a vector valued property that can, for example, be its velocity or whatever. And what you want to do is you want to loop over all particles and you want to compute the difference in this property A uh, between uh, pairs of particles. You want to compute the square of this um, and then uh, store this on uh, each particle. Um, and you can write it like this. And you want to compute some uh, global property, which is kind of the fourth power of the uh, difference in these properties uh, for all pairs of particles. And you just want to store that. So and that's shown in this code here. So you have to create your uh, data types for your particles um, somehow. Then you need to write your kernel code. So that's the code that computes uh, this here for each particle pair. So that's some C code. So you loop over uh, uh, the R. So that's the number of properties that each particle has. Uh, you compute the difference between the first and the second particle. You square it and you sum it up in this loop. And then this bit here does the same for this property. It stores it. Uh, sorry, no, this stores this in the BI. Um, and I'm not sure if that code actually includes this bit here. Um, yeah, oh no, yeah, it's there now. So that updates the global property. And then you write um, some code which uh, then executes this. So that's just done here. So you tell it how you want to access your data. So you want to, um, you want to uh, read the A only, you want to increment the B and the S is uh, incremented as well. And then you just execute your loop and that's it. So um, yeah, so that's the same picture. Um, so um, again, so the user only writes the high level algorithms and the local kernels, but they don't see uh, any of that dirty bit down here. And an important thing really that I want to stress is that this is not just a Python scripting thing that you use to drive your simulation. So there is kind of lots of kind of uh, Python wrappers for this, uh, for MD codes uh, that make it easier to, to run this, but this is kind of more, um, uh, this is kind of more, um, yeah, uh, intrusive and it kind of really gets to the bottom of this. It doesn't really just wrap some existing code. Okay, so some results. So we ran this. Uh, so Balena is our uh, supercomputer. Well, it's a small cluster in Bath. So uh, we ran this on um, up to 64 uh, nodes. Um, and uh, we also ran this on um, uh, some GPU cards. So uh, the user doesn't see that. So they see the same Python code. Um, and this is just a Leonard Jones benchmark with. Um, uh, a million particles, and we compared it to DL Poly and uh, LAMPS, uh, both on CPUs and GPUs. So these are kind of codes that are out there. Um, and here I show the, um, the node or the GPU count. So we went up to 64. Everything in gray is just what happens on a single node. So you usually want to be a bit careful with that because you have some strange effects kicking in there. And then I just show the, the runtime here. And what you see is that um, so our code is, the, is the, the black line here. So the runtime goes down and it's actually competitive with um, all these other codes uh, here. So, so LAMPS and DL Poly, it's actually much faster than DL Poly. And we are also kind of in the same kind of area as these codes on, on GPUs. Um, so this is uh, just the same plot, but just showing the parallel, showing the parallel efficiency. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think we are competitive with other codes. I mean, eventually it will obviously drop 
um, but we're not doing really much worse than lumps here. Okay, so um, almost done. Just um, a few words on this. Um, so what I said at the very beginning is um, I said that people often do the kind of post-processing of their data with some local non-parallel code. You can also do your post-processing with, with our code. So I just picked uh, an example here. So um, this is an example we did the simulation and then you want to know something about um, uh, how these kind of particles are um, uh, clustered or connected. Um, so you can do something which is called bond order analysis, or you can do some common neighbor analysis. So that somehow classifies pairs um, uh, by um, uh, these numbers here. So that's uh, uh, the end is the number of common neighbors. Uh, then there's the number of neighbors with links um, uh, and B, and then there's some neighbor clusters. So don't ask me about the details, but there's an algorithm for this in this paper here. Um, and the nice thing is you can just implement this in our framework and you get um, your, um, you get your post-processing code as well. So here are some results. So um, this is just um, uh, some result from this uh, bond order analysis, just to show you that it gives you something uh, sensible. Um, and then there's again, some scaling plot only going up to four uh, nodes, uh, but the code actually does uh, scale nicely. Okay, so I'm at the end. Um, so um, here's just a brief summary. So um, the challenge we looked at was including electrostatic interactions in code. So this is expensive. The complexity grows like order n squared. So that kills you. Um, so the fast multiple method has order n complexity um, for n particles, but you need to be a bit careful when you use this for Monte Carlo or kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. And um, we adapted it for Monte Carlo to reduce the cost per local move to order log n. And for kinetic Monte Carlo, you can use it and the cost per KMC step is uh, order uh, n. And then finally, I talked a bit about the implementation in this performance portable uh, Python uh, framework. So the user writes some C kernels and Python algorithms for orchestrating uh, these, um, these kernels. And then there's a code generation system that executes this code uh, under the hood on any hardware. And as I said before, so actually, in reality, we kind of worked the other way around. So we started with this implementation um, and then we um, adapted it to kinetic Monte Carlo because that's what the physicists were interested in. And then finally, we looked at uh, Monte Carlo as, uh, as well. Okay, so here's some papers. Um, so um, there's a paper on this, on this uh, domain specific language, if you want to have a look at that. Um, and then there's two papers on KMC and on Monte Carlo, which contain uh, more uh, details on how this works. In particular, one thing I kind of skimmed over was um, the treatment of um, periodic boundary conditions. And that's really the, the messy bit uh, when you actually then think about these algorithms, how you include these uh, it gets quite complicated. Um, how you, for example, take out these um, effects of dipoles and things like that uh, gets is non-trivial. So yeah, let me stop here. <laughs>